Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. In this episode, I will talk about the Firefly conductor. And it's actually nothing more than just a vacuum fluorescent display controller. So here we have the microcontroller which controls this vacuum fluorescent display, or for short, VFD. And this episode will mainly be about uh, how this display works and how they can be controlled by any microcontroller. This is the vacuum fluorescent display which I've salvaged from an old cash register. It was lying around and nobody was using it anymore. Since I was interested to know how cash register worked, I took it apart and there were not a lot of interesting parts inside, but I still kept this vacuum fluorescent display because it looked nice and I thought for a small project it could be nice to use it. So this display acquired old technology. They are not used too often anymore. They are bulky, but they have this nice display style where the, the segments glow up like fluorescence and I thought it shouldn't be too hard to control it and why not why not do it ourselves for a project and have some some really retro style display so that was one of the reasons this was lying around in on my cupboard for more than one year now so it was time to get used to learn how this works but the other reason was that previously in my older project you saw I used this microcontroller this is an Atmel Atmega 32.8p and it's a very nice small microcontroller to, to for entry level. Most of the time you use the Arduino platform and the Arduino the, uh, IDE which makes it a lot easier. I use the chip and just plain C code which I compile directly uh, uh, inside without using the Arduino IDE or the Arduino library. And yeah, these are nice, but I thought it was time to to test another microcontroller and I went to this one. So with this one you have an 8-bit microcontroller which runs at around 20 megahertz and for most electronic projects it's actually quite okay, it's enough. But I wanted to try this one which gets m more and more popular. This is an STM32F103 and it's based on an ARM Cortex-M3 it's a 32-bit microcontroller, so it, the calculations are more powerful. It runs at 72 megahertz compared to the 20 megahertz here, so it runs a lot faster with more powerful instructions. Um, it's ARM, which is getting used in every mobile phone or every embedded systems now. So it, it's another development environment and it has a lot more IOs. It has a lot more capabilities. This one just has one UART port, one SPI, why I2C. Here you have three UART ports, three SPI, three I2C. So it does, oh, not, probably not three I2C, but you have a lot more peripherals. You have a lot more timer. It's a really more powerful uh, microcontroller. And you can get these Arduino clones for less than $2. So this makes them really throwable and really cheap. But this one cost doesn't cost much more. You can get them from less than $4. And for $4 you get a really powerful thing also with USB and with lots of um, input outputs. And it it is powerful. Um, probably I won't use all the time this power. I won't use all the time these um, input outputs. But I thought I'd still give it a go because I mean it's not because you don't use it that you shouldn't um, that you don't use all the capabilities of a chip that you use use this chip. Um, I can use it later for anything else. And once I have a project which re requires more than one serial port, this is perfect. While well, this is more restrictive, and I also wanted to learn how this works. So I will control the vacuum fluorescent display with this microcontroller, and this was a really good start to try playing around with this because I was unfamiliar with programming this ARM chip and this microcontroller. And let's first talk about the vacuum fluorescent display. Let's first have a look at this vacuum fluorescent display. And I'll quickly explain how vacuum fluorescent display work and what the theory behind is. While it's not mandatory to understand it and to know it, to drive it, it is still useful and it's not too complicated and it won't take long to explain. So all the white segments which you see, here we have lines, here we have dots, these are called anode. And it's just a piece of metal which is coated by some um, fluorescent powder or fluorescent material. 
and often it's phosphor. And phosphor, when it's hit by electrons, starts to glow, and this is what gives this sort of turquoise light from this vacuum fluorescent display. So we have the anode, which glow when they're hit by electrons, so we need to produce electrons. And these are the wires which you see going across all the display. Here are all the wires, and they go all along the display. Um, these are called the cathodes, and they will start emitting electrons when they ge get heated up. So we have the electrons coming from these wires, and then they will hit the cathode, and the cathode will just light up. Now, you can control if the cathode gets li lit up or not by just disconnecting the wire behind it, but there is an even better trick, or uh, even more useful trick, and yeah, probably you can use, you can see here, between the filament and the anode on the back, you have some kind of grid, and it is actually called a grid. What's useful is in grid is that um, if you also power it negatively, well, like the like the cathode, then the electrons which are produced by the cathode will not pass the grid, they will be just reflected, and this way, um, none of these um, none of these anodes will glow up, so you can block all the electrons. But what's even more interesting but than just blocking is that if you power them, and if you control the power, you can make the electron fly even faster and hit even faster uh, and hit with more force the anode. And this way the anode will glow even better because the electrons hit it the electrons which are going there are going fa um, are hitting it faster or with more force. And that's why you have this uh, these grids. So we have the filaments emitting the electrons, which pass, w which don't pass or pass with lots of force the grid by controlling the grid. And then we have the anode, which gets light up if it's connected and if the electron can, can hit it. And that's basically it. Um, that's, that's all there is to it. What's Important to know is that to, to light these things up and to control you need high voltages. Now we know how vacuum fluorescent display works. But as you can see, there are lots of wide segments which you need to control. So there are lots of pins. Here there is one row of pins, numerous pins, and on the other side there is another row of lots of pins. Um, because of this high number of pins and because you need some high voltage for the electron to have lots of energy and hit the anode so it glows up really bright, you need high voltages uh, on, this, on, this, on these pins. This is why very often you will use vacuum fluorescent display drivers, like this one here. And luckily when I took this vacuum fluorescent display, the drivers came just with it. And it's very often the case that they are actually included on the board itself. Here we have a Supertex, that's the logo, that's the name for this logo or this brand, uh, HV518P. And as you can see, it has lots of pins. So it has actually 40 pins, but it is still not enough to drive all these pins. Here we have more than 40 pins and we have even more on the other side. So there isn't just one of this chip. If you look on the back, up, you will see that here we have the first chip, here we have the row for the vacuum fluorescent display, here we have the second row for the vacuum fluorescent display, and in between we have again some rows of something. And if you count them you will see they have 40 pins, they have the exact same size as this, so it's very probable that simply we have three of these vacuum fluorescent display drivers. If you look on the side, you will see there's a second one here, and then there's a third one on the whole back. That's it here. There's a third one just there. So we have three of these vacuum fluorescent display drivers, which have lots of IOs, so there should be plenty enough to control all the segments which are on this vacuum fluorescent display. And let's check how this driver work, because in the end we have the port here and we will control the drivers using this port. This is the datasheet for the integrated circuit which we saw on the vacuum fluorescent board, the HV518. It's made by Supertex and as we've guessed it, it's a vacuum fluorescent display driver. We saw it has 40 pins and this is why 30, 
it can drive 32 channels. So this is quite okay. And one of the things we've learned with vacuum fluorescent displays is that they have lots of segments. Since at display, you want to be able to show a lot of information. That's why this one provides 32 channels. So you can drive up to 32 segments. The other thing which are important with vacuum fluorescent display is so first we have the number of pins and then we have the voltage. We need high voltage. And this is also shown here. This can pr drive up to 90 volt output swing. So this is quite good. Here's a small description and actually the data sheet is quite small. And the most important thing is this block diagram which explains how it works. So first and most importantly we have this 32 bit register. It has two lines which are going in, the clock and the data in. So whenever the clock triggers, this shift register will read the data which is in data in and store it in this shift register, one after another, so in a serial way. Afterwards, they go to these latches and then you can use the latch enable. So whatever you put, the 32 bits you've put in this register serially, which you clocked in, if you enable the latch, they will be output in parallel. So the, all the 32 bits be output in parallel and will go to, to this end gate. To enable the output you need to set the strobe to low which will yeah enable the output and then here we have the actual drivers which are um, connected to VPP. So VPP is the 90 volt which we've seen up to 90 volt which are there to, to drive the pins of the vacuum fluorescent display driver and this is why it's called so um, high voltage. So yeah Pretty simple. Shift the data in, output it in parallel, so you don't need to have 32 pins. You can shift the data in with just one pin or two pin with the clock, and then drive the 32 channels. And we saw we have three of these chips, so we sh would want to control three of them, but instead of having three times data in and three times clock, what they did in within the design is also provide an output. So Whatever you shift, so it takes the 32 bits which you shift in, but if you shift even more bits, then whatever is going to went to data in will go to data out. And then the clock is shared between all. So here we have one chip and then the you will have another chip and the clock is shared between all of them. So they are synchronized. And this way you can tra chain as many chips as you want as of these display drivers. And we have three of them which just share uh, data in, which is then forwarded, relayed, or chained, and then the clock. And that's basically how it works. Now the rest of the uh, of the data sheet is what voltages it operates. So here we have to operate at 5 volts for the chip itself. The output pins are up to 90 volts. The signals is 5 volt 2. We have the dip package. These are the rise time. So quite short data sheet here it explains how it works and here we have actually the um, the sequence which I've just explained so we have the clock which is right there and then whenever you have one sequence of clock whatever is data in will be considered as valid and will be stored in the shift register and this is the shift register content once you've input the 32 bits then the data is valid you can enable the latch so you it outputs the data in parallel. This is why the data is then valid. And if you uh, put the strobe low, it will be output to the um, driver pins. And this is why the high voltage will then be valid. That's the simple sequence diagram. And we will implement this on the board using simple um, general purpose IOs. So we just need four pins, clock, data, latch, strobe, and then we just will fake, we will create a clock signal and whenever the clock is triggered there will be something on the data line. And the data is um, saved in the shift register when the clock rises high. That's the most important information. Um, yeah, um, here this is the uh, the other, before we can implement anything, we need to find out which pin is what. And we have this 40 pin, um, 40 lead or 40 pins package, the PDIP, which is the P which we saw on the chip. And as we can see, we have 40 pins. Um, this is the voltage, the 
high voltage, this is data out, which we've seen before. Um, here we have ground, strobe, clock, latch enable, data in, and VDD. These are the most important pins. All the other ones are high voltage pins, the 32 high voltage things. So let's find out on the board where these control pins are so we can control this display driver. We know how this vacuum fluorescent display works and we also know how the driver for the VFD works. Now we want to be able to transmit data to this driver so it can control the vacuum fluorescent display and here we have the connector um, which is somehow connected to this chip and we want to figure out which pin is corresponding to which signal on this, on this chip. So <coughs> here are the pins which are from this display, uh, from this driver, and here's the corresponding connector, and we want to figure out where VPP, where ground, um, strobe, clock, latch enable, and data in and VDD are. The other ones are the output pins to, to drive this, so it's less important because we want to uh, first control this chip and send data to this chip. So to do that, I simply use a multimeter, which I've set into continuity mode, so whenever the leads are shorted, it makes a beep. And the continuity mode is often denotated by this symbol. Let's put it to the side. Away <coughs> with this jumper. And then we start figuring out which pin is connected to what. So here we have the list and we know that pin 1 is VPP. Pin 1 is here on this chip. Because it's a P-dip, this is pin 1. Uh, here is the dent on left, the dent on the chip. So the left pin on the dent is pin 1. That's usually the case, but the data sheet will tell you. Here is pin 20, 21, and then 40. So let's flip the board. Have one lead on pin 1, and then go through the connector lead and figure out, ah, uh, you see? The third one beeps, so it means that the third one is VPP. Oh, so we take a pen and note that VPP is the third pin. And we'll do the same for, for the other ones. Um, basically the same. Now what's interesting is data in. Because if you do the same with data in, we know that data in is pin 39. And pin 39 is this one. It goes 1, 20, 21, 40. This is pin 39. So if we go through the pins of the connector, you'll notice that none of them beep. So data in of this chip is not connected to to, to the connector is not bound to it. But we know that this, this we can chain the this chip. So instead of checking here, we will check for example on this one. This is pin 39 of the other chip. Go through it. And here we find that it beeps. So it means that this one is the first in chain. Because this is where the data in will go through. And then after the data in has gone through the shift register, it will be shifted out from serial out, which is pin 2. Pin 2 is here, and if we check the other chips, so it should go in pin 39, not on this one, on this one. So this is chip number 2, because serial out goes to data in, and then here we have serial out, and it should be there, yeah, data in. So pin 1, uh, first chip, second chip, third chip. And now we have all the pin out. Uh, you can also read, actually, the traces, um, even if it's double-sided, here you have traces also here. You can even start reading the traces and we can see that, for example, this one is connected up to here and so on. But I like the multimeter test because it works quite nice for all the chips without worrying about the traces. Yeah, so now we know how to connect this and we will start programming the microcontroller so we can shift data in using this port. Here is the setup. Here we have the vacuum fluorescent display board with the driver. Here I have a voltage regulator, a power supply, which I can provide power for VPP, so to light up the segments. Here I have the microcontroller, which will just shift out the data. So it will create a clock signal and shift only once, so we can enable all outputs on this driver. And we can see between this board and this board, the connection, there is this small thing. And this is a level shifter. So this board provides input outputs at 3.3 volts, but this requires 5 volts. And this is why I have a level shifter in between. 
we figured already the pinout out and I'm just using any general purpose input output, nothing special there. And here, connected here, I have a USB to serial converter so I can control what's happening here. So first what I will do is reset the board. Let's see, uh, here we see the LED. And if I press on the bot, uh, if I enter something over the serial port, you will see the LED switches off and it should have shifted out the data to this shift register. And now this should drive all the segments because I'm shifting once, 32 once, or at least 32 times three once. And if we enable the voltage, if we enable the, the power, we can see here that the, seg the segments are enabled. Now this is just at 10 volt and this is why it's pretty dim, but already at 10 volt you can see some, some light. And if I go higher in the voltage, here with 14, 20, 28, and that's the max I can do. And at 28 it is already pretty bright. So let's go back down. And we can see that really all the segments have been enabled and this is because we've sent ones to all the bits of uh, all the bits to one to enable all the data out. And this pretty much works nice. Now if I can if I reset the board, you see it resets it back, and then if I press again, up, it resets. So that works. For now we only shifted once there, so we've enabled all segments. And the next step is to figure out which segment which bit actually represent which segment. And for that, what we will simply do is just flip the bits or flip every time one bit. So instead of sending just once everywhere, we will just send once except at one place where it will be zero. And then we shift through the bits, the zero, to see which segment gets deactivated. And with this deactivated segment, we can note down that this bit corresponds to this segment. So let's start, we have the voltage which is on. Here every time I press on a button you will see the LEDs change, or at least the green LED change. And let's start. So in the beginning we have all the segments and as you can see the value which is sent is FFF, so all bits are set to one. And now every time I press there will be a zero bit uh, within this stream of data and it will shift around the values. So here it didn't do anything. We can continue. It means that this voltage or this output of the driver hasn't been used and hasn't been mapped to any of the segments. Continue. Up, up, still nothing. Ah, and that's the first one. Here you see the first bit which we have, this uh, which we flipped disables this uh, this whole dot matrix, three by seven dot matrix. And if we continue, this is the next segment is this one. Then we can go through the segments. Now it disables the digits. So go through the digits. And now we, are, we see that all, not single digits are disabled, but all the un underline of all the digits are disabled. And if we can go now it's the dot, the comma, and then the seven segments of the digits. And here is the um, dots on the five by seven matrix. So this is the upper left dot. Here we see at the bottom right because I flipped the screen around, but this is the upper left and it's disabled on all the um, dot matrix display. If we continue, we see that it's going through the dot matrix. Now, <coughs> there are two interesting things to, to figure out is that um, sometimes we disable whole segments, so the whole dot matrix or the whole digits or whole parts, and sometimes we disable all the segments across all the same parts. The reason for that is because we it's it's pretty hard to control every segment on every parts individually because then we would have too many pins like here we have seven segments plus three optional segments so it's 10 segments for one digit we have 10 digits so we have a hundred segments just we would require a hundred separate pins just for that and then we have the dot matrix display so this is five by seven that's 35 um, 35 segments per display 
per part, per, per matrix, and then we have 12 of this matrix. So in the whole, in, if, um, if we wanted to control all the segments individually, we would need 520 pins. And as you can see here, we don't have 520 pins. And 500, we would also require to drive 520 pins separately. This is pretty hard, so we would require a lot of this chip. So this is why we do multiplexing. And the idea of multiplexing, stop. The idea of multiplexing is that you first select which part you want to light up, and then you control which segment within this part you want to light up. For example, we know how to enable or how to disable all the grids. So this is the part, I will call them the grids, because if we look closely to it, this is actually what you see which is separated. So the grid which enables the electron to fly through or not is actually what you control. And all these parts are controlled by one grid. So first, you have to control which grid you want to enable, and then within this grid you can control the segments. Then you switch and you can display whatever you want on there. Then you switch to the next grid and you do the same thing and you can display something else because this one is not affected anymore. And you go through all the segments this way and this is the way to multiplex everything. One advantage is the low number of pins because you don't have to control all the segments but then you first control which grid you want to enable and within this grid you can individually control the segments. And if you pass to the next grid you can control the segments another way. But you have to go through all the grids to enable all the display, meaning that you can only light up one grid at a time. Now here we can we've enabled all the grids at a time, but this is because we've uh, yeah we can enable multiple grids at a time too. But if you enable multiple grids at a time, you will see that the segments you select affect all the grids which you've enabled. And the next part will simply be to be able to control which grid and which segment we want to control, we want to, to light up and display text on it. So we'll implement that. The vacuum fluorescent display, which I've salvaged from a cache register, had two parts as I'll show you. This is the cache cashier part and this is the customer part. And I've only shown you this part now. I didn't show you this part because it is broken, as you can probably already see here, but we'll have a closer look. This is the second vacuum fluorescent display and it is meant to show the price for the customer. It gets connected to the main board using this large cable and it doesn't have any driver. It's really the, just the display and that's also why it needs so many cables. I'm not using it because it is broken. I, I don't know how, bec maybe because of age, maybe because I did something wrong, I broke this display. And as you can see here, the filaments, which should, acro should go across the whole display, the two filaments here are broken, so these are the cathodes, and they are meant to emit the electrons. And if no electrons is emitted, then the the segments will not light up. And um, yeah, we can still try to see what the result is of some broken cathodes. So these two are broken, and these two are working actually. So let's try that. Here is the complete setup with the two vacuum fluorescent display and the auxiliary vacuum fluorescent display just connected to the main one using this large cable. And let's try to see what it does when we power it up. So let's reset the board. Let's provide some power. And let's start enabling all the segments. So here you see all the segments are enabled and you can also see that here all the segments are also enabled, although you only see the lower ones because this is where the cathodes are actually not broken. So they are continuing emitting electron, while the upper ones don't work anymore. And if we go through the pattern, let's scroll through the bits. So here I'm flipping the bits to see which bit correspond to which line or VFD segment. Here. Now we can see we started shifting here. So there is no effect on this screen. Let's continue. Ah, and now you can see the first effect. Here the first digit disappeared and here also the digit disappeared. And if we, can con if we continue, we see also the digit disappear. And then it's the segment disappearing on the digits and you don't probably don't see a lot more, but here, yeah. So 
you can see it's the same thing. So what is displayed here is actually the same than what is displayed here. It's the same lines which go there. And we don't need any more drivers to separately uh, drive them. So we only have three drivers. They drive this and this is only a copy of the digits here. And it's not a perfect copy actually because you didn't see it, but the comma and the underline are not present. Only the dot is present. So although it is in the vacuum present display, the two lines are not connected on the cables and not connected here. But yeah, since it's broken, I won't use it anymore. I will concentrate on the main vacuum fluorescent display. Since the auxiliary VFT is broken, I won't use it anymore. I'm still not sure why it doesn't work or why the cathode broke. Maybe because of age, maybe because I sh I've shaken it too much. Um, maybe because I sent the wrong signal or had too high voltage. I, I'm really not sure why, but the, the main one works. Now you can, you see this mark on the top right. You could think that here something happened, so maybe it gets too high or maybe a short happened because there is this kind of burns mark. But actually this mark is there from beginning on, on this vacuum fluorescent display. And it's not, and it's something they used to actually tell if this VFD is still valid or not. Because as the name say, vacuum fluorescent display, it needs some vacuum. And inside here there is a vacuum, so when the process is done they suck all the air out of this small hole. And if the vacuums get lost, then the parts here may may not work. So this is why they put some small chemicals which will oxide, oxidize, not sure, when there is air inside and when there is no vacuum anymore. So since it's broken, we can try it and see what effect it has when air is coming back here. So let's zoom. On this part, here you can see the rainbow color, that's the original part. And if we break it, up. here it broke, so the air should go in. And this should lose its color and start to oxide. Oxidize. Really broken, or is it just a bit broken? Let's break it even more. Now it's completely broken. And here you can see there is already some some effect on this mark. The ring is not the same and I think with time it will also change. Here you can also think the, the cathodes, they moved up. They've gone uh, all here, I think, because of the pressure difference. That's, that's fun to see. And here also the cathodes rolled up here, maybe because of the pressure difference. And yeah, this changes color and will continue change color and say this vacuum fluorescent display is definitely broken. Now I've implemented that first my code selects the grid because we know which line it corresponds to and then the segment we also know which bit corresponds to this to this segment and we can go individually through the characters. So if I restart the microcontroller we will first see that it tests all segments to see if they are still working. That's just for the user to know if it's working and then we can go through the grid. So it selects the grids and then it displays something else on the on the on the on this specific character, but the problem is that this is individual, and if we want to light everything up, we need to go through all the digits fast enough, and that's what the next thing will be. Then the next code, what the next code does, is simply go through the grid very fast. Instead of me having to type all the time, we will just have the code do it and then we will also see the LED blink. So it first does the test and if I press on thing you see that the LED blinks pretty fast and this significates that that it goes through the through the through the grid. And actually probably you cannot see but there is actually something. But it's very 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 dim. And I've set it to the same voltage than the just the demo we had before where we went to the segments individually. We had seven volts and if I increase the volt, no that's decreasing, if I increase the voltage you see the text begins to appear but we are at 28 volts and we can barely see the text so it's not very bright. This is why we need actually high voltages because we want the segments to be bright even if we're scanning and refreshing very fast through them. So we'll add um, a voltage booster to have it even brighter. 
Now we've seen that 28 volt isn't pretty, uh, doesn't make the the segments pretty bright if we have to refresh through all the grids, and we need higher voltages. Here I have a DC to DC boost converter, and what it does is convert everything which is between 10 volts and 32 volts to 36 volts up to 60 volts. So I'm providing it with 12 volts, and I, if I power it on, we can see we start at 36 volts, and now if I let's restart, you can see that already at 36 volts it's a lot brighter than we had at 20 um, at 28 volts, just from the 36 volts. And if I go through, if I enable uh, refreshing all the segments, we can start see that it starts showing um, some something a lot a bit brighter. So we can continue enabling and if I turn on this 10 turn resistor pot you can see that it goes higher and higher and as the voltage goes higher you see the brightness of the VFD also increases up and let's go up to 50 volts this is what I see as quite comfortable with the eye and there we have it. Yeah, close to 50 volts. And at 50 volts, we, we see the segments quite enough. Now you see that it's flickering because the refresh is not particularly good. Uh, what I'm doing here is using the in GPI also inputs and outputs and toggling them all the time, and it's not particularly efficient. And also the refresh I chose is actually not really visible to the human eye, but it's a lot more visible to the camera, which has a corresponding refresh rate. So the next step will be to a bit improve this refresh rate and also improve the code, which is in the microcontroller. And here is the final setup. So um, I've used the cable, which originally came with this VFD board. It's pretty nice because it has the right connector. It's long enough. It has a ferrite bead to keep out the high, the noise. And as you can see, I've connected it directly to the microcontroller without using any voltage level shifter. So even if the data sheet requires the voltage to be above 4.3 or 4.5 volts to be detected as high, it works quite well without and with the 3.3 .3 volt I can send also once. Then I've connected the power. This is the second line which you see on the back. And for the power to drive the VFD drivers and then we have the power to drive the segments itself. So these are this is the DC to DC voltage booster and it outputs 50 volts. And now I'm connected to to the board using USB and whatever I type in should be displayed right here. So let's try with hello world. And this works quite nice. I've improved the code quite a lot, so instead of using GPIOs to shift out the data, I'm using the Serial Peripheral Interface, SPI, which actually has a pretty similar format for shifting out the data. There's a clock line and there's a transmit line, and there's nothing more you need to do. So you can drive it, you can send the data pretty fast and pretty reliably with by using the hardware. The other improvement I did is I'm using a timer to refresh the segments and here I think I have a refresh rate I had around 100 hertz so the whole display is refreshed 100 times per second and yeah it looks pretty nice to the to the eye I'm not sure on the camera but it also looks nice on the camera I've also used a last trick is that you've seen that we can drive the um, the matrix grids separately from the digit grids so I'm driving these two independently this allows me to have an even better refresh because there is more time spent on each of the digits than if i would go through all of them sequentially and yeah this is how i've learned how to drive vacuum fluorescent display how to program on this arm microcontroller it was a lot of fun but actually this was just the first part there will be more to come and this display will be put into good use. So, yeah, there is more to come. And as always, the source code is available on my git. There's more documentation on the wiki and enjoy.